Yo. Yo. Um. So, I'm just going off memory, just probably just like you are. But what I remember is people defending the protest, and I remember people um trying to counter the narrative narrative that they were violent. Pro- like it was mostly violent protest. They were saying, you know, um, you know, it's mostly peaceful. It was 95, 96% peaceful. You know, the couple mm-hmm. instances of violence, they, they're, um, they're by people that are like, we're not like organized or related to the BLM movement. Although I think like that narrative has changed over the years. Um, we, we have learned a lot more about BLM and their in- intentions. Um, the, you know, uh, the or, the organization, not the movement. Um, the BLM movement is more like decentralized. But I just wanted to push back against your narrative that you know there were tons of people defending the rioting. I, I don't remember it that way. Maybe that's why I was asking. Like, could you just refresh my memory if I missed those Walsh or TYT videos? Yeah, I don't. Um, so I would have to go back through like my own vods of like where I covered the stuff and that's that's years three years of vods that I would have to find uh something in but um the so oh, yeah, yeah no, you're right I mean, like obviously little... the majority of the protests weren't violent and this is what I was talking about at the beginning is I think like most people were upset at the, uh, about like the disproportionate amount of violence within the protests and the fact that there were people defending the violence and so like I agree that there like obviously the majority of it wasn't violent and i i repeated this all the time when i was debating people about blm and trying to defend the movement but the the narrative seemed to get out of control with tons of people seemingly defending the violence um yeah it's three years ago i will try to find what i can let's see but yeah like i said i mean you can find anything you want on the internet so what what I was looking for from you is like prominent people like, you know, like you said, Vosh or TYT. Now, I'm sure, you know, you probably had some people on your panel. Um, defend, may, they may or may not have been defending the riots and the violence. But I, like when I when I say nobody, when, when I would want to counter your statement that a lot of people or tons of people were defending it. What what and I want to be very clear, what I mean is like prominent people, people with a big platform like i remember uh, kamala harris was um bailing people out of jail and that kind of mm-hmm. got twisted into she was defending the riots by yeah. bailing you know the rioters out of jail but no she was bailing pro people who are who are arrested at the protest by the police and pol- people forget how the police were acting that summer i mean the police were out of pocket in a lot of cities doing the things like um like false arrest of people um like arresting protesters uh hold on my daughter's uh yeah go hold on one second i'm sorry no so sorry about that um yeah what i remember was like the police kind of using like very forceful tactics against protesters and that kind of exasperated things now you have your outlier cities like Portland and Seattle where there was that crazy shit going on. But for the most part, in like a lot of the major cities like, you know, Chicago and Philadelphia and uh, New York, um, it was it was just mainly like peaceful protesters agitated by, and there were some agitators in there who destroyed buildings and there was a lot, there was violence with that, but mostly it was, peaceful and i don't like the reef so i guess like my main argument against you was like i don't like the reframing of it as there were tons of people on the left defending it and then like you were saying like if you if you, if you were to pull the left um well maybe destiny said that who was who, who said like if you pull the left uh most people will say that uh january 6 was more violent than uh the blm destiny or, said yeah. that but i i think i agree destiny with that. that that seems to be my perception as well um so oh so i i don't think like um there's anything to back that up like there's any uh data or polls to polling to back that up now if that's just vibes and like just you know the way you interpreted it i guess i can't really argue about that but like well i mean that's um, what he literally was... said is like that his feeling is that if you uh 
if you ask people on the left, they would say that there was more violence at, um, or more people died at the at January sixth than in all of the BLM riots or protests. Yeah, that's possible, but I just I didn't see it, and that's just not my recollection of it that's why like sometimes i'll just have a reflexive reaction to things and so that's why i was in your comments just you know giving my reaction but i haven't studied up on this so i'm not going to make take any hard stances on this but just my relaxation recollection of things and the, the way i re was remembering it um it was that people supported the protest they they supported um the expression of a discontent with police and um the way that there's also this other narrative that destiny likes to push and i know i'm not talking to you i'm not talking to destiny but um mm -hmm. you, you kind of are agreeing with him but he likes to say things like um you know people are people were protesting because police were killing black unarmed black people now that, that's part of it but that's a little it, it is a little like um missing the point the bigger larger picture of why people were actually protesting that summer i just don't want that part to get lost to history in people's minds um because Four years have passed now. Three years have passed. Three, four when years. When you say that's not now. the reason, you mean like, because that's obviously what sparked everything. You just mean that wasn't like their their main request was not stop shooting unarmed black people. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the killing of George Floyd obviously was not a shooting, and then obviously you know, like, and then but the Jacob Blake thing where they they shot him, um, that was the the spark of the thing with Kyle Rittenhouse and Kenosha and all that, but. That had mm -hmm. been going, the protests have been widely going on pretty much a lot of that summer for like two months up to that point. When the yeah, but the, but after Jacob Blake, they literally rioted for like two to three days in a row, like burning down that, tons of businesses. Yes, in that particular city, yes. Yeah. Like, are you saying all over the country or just in Kenosha? No, just in that, yeah, just in Kenosha, yeah. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they were, they were, uh, they were going pretty hard over there. And, uh, you know, that whole Kyle Rittenhouse thing, I don't, I don't know where I land on it because I know if if I were Kyle Rittenhouse, I would have done the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sympathetic to the argument that he shouldn't have been there in the first place, but that we, you know, you're past that point when you're in that situation. So yeah. I can't really get get mad at Kyle Rittenhouse, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I said at the beginning, like obviously the majority of the protests were not violent, and then even the protests that were violent had a minority of people there who were violent. So it was like 5% of the protests were violent. And then each one of those protests, it was like less than 5% of the people there were doing something violent. So overall, it was like 0.5% of people protesting were actually doing something violent out of all of the protests. And this is like, again, like not just not just in Kenosha, not just in Washington, not just in the United States. This was like a worldwide protest all over the place. It's likely that you're going to see more violence. It just seemed to be in, again, this is maybe I'm like buying into propaganda that I was watching from somewhere. I don't know, but yeah, it seemed to be over and over. I saw people defending the the rioting. I ended up continuously uh, debating people on whether or not the rioting was okay and whether or not like uh, they kept talking about like police aren't shouldn't even be allowed to be at protests. And so if they're there, you have a right to go ahead and and attack them because it it's in self defense because they're they're there to like uh defend capital and like it was just over and over this was kind of the the vibes that i was getting from the people that i was talking to and the things that i was watching i don't think it was a majority of people on the left but it was consistent and common that like if i was on twitter or on a twitch panel or um or watching the news that i was going to at some point see somebody defending the violence yeah, it's because dumb fucks on the internet don't know what the fuck they're talking about, and you know they'll just crowd out the last thing they heard on, um, you know, their 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 favorite streamer or YouTube person personality's opinion. They'll just, you know. Well, but I think that that's what Destiny's that. saying. Is not just it's not the problem. Isn't just that people are saying those things, but that the pushback against it wasn't all that strong. Like it seemed to be a lot of right wingers pushing back against it, and then when they would push back against it, the response was, "Yeah, but a minority of the protests are violent," and it's like, "Okay, like yeah, you're right," and a lot of right wingers are trying to paint the entire uh, movement as violent, but also you're 
kind of playing cover for people who are defending the violence and now not like you're not joining them in that process of stigmatizing defending the violence and the rioting and stuff and again i'm not even saying that people should be doing that because like I, I honestly i think to some extent like violence is okay i think that there's like rioting is necessary in some ways i think that like some things and places can be burnt down and I'm not going to care so much. Like, um, but it's, but when, when we're making like descriptive claims about how things went and what happened it, over that period of time, I don't think that he's incorrect that. Yeah. Like people were kind of shifting narratives when pushback against, uh, the violence came. So I agree, I agree with you that um, people were not pushing back hard enough and people a lot of times do not push back hard enough for fear of looking uh, or, you know, um, upsetting the apple cart, uh, upsetting their teammates, upsetting the people on their side. Uh, what happens a lot of times with things like, like that, in my opinion, is people don't know where, um, like, the... If, if you're pr trying to push the narrative, or not push the narrative, if, if your point was that, like, these these protests are turning violent and uh we therefore we should stop all protesting because of the the small amount of violence it to people who support the protest it feels like you're trying to that the people who are saying that we're trying to quash the movement and mm -hmm. like if you don't know where somebody's coming from you're going to defend something that mi you might not otherwise defend like mm -hmm. if um if 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 my teach if, if if my teacher if my son's teacher says you know he was uh, fighting somebody or he was arguing with somebody in class or he was talking back um i know she's coming from a place of you know wanting the best for him so i'm not going to like argue her on that point or or like try to um you know interrogate her further she uh i know where she's coming from but if some random guy on the street said my son you know said this or said that to him, um, I would be more, I would be more dubious, I'll be more skeptical of his motives. Does that make sense? I know that was kind of yeah. rambly, but like, yeah, of course. I mean, even I was getting accused of, like, when I was saying like stuff like, yeah, the the um, the majority of the protests are peaceful and crap like that. I was getting accused of defending violence and rioting and all sorts of crap. Or when I would say like, yeah, like there's there like. Sometimes rioting can be necessary or violence can be necessary for political reasons. I was getting accused of defending violence. And so, yeah, like I, I got thrown into that bucket many times, uh, even though I didn't feel like that's what I was doing. So I, I definitely understand that part. Yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. Because I've been watching you for a little bit. Um, I take it you're more like in the center kind of, right? Like it, I might be I think wrong. it's hard. To... I don't know exactly where you but. Yeah, it's hard to say because I like I don't like to call myself a moderate because I don't think my positions are moderate, but I do have positions that I'm with the far left on. I've got no, a bunch of positions that I'm with like the moderate right on. I've got a bunch of positions that I'm with the, um, you know, like the libs on. And so there's I, I think it's like too much of a broad array of areas where i don't i don't know how i could actually like uh categorize myself in that way um do you ever find yourself being sympathetic to any like far right um beliefs or uh political position um when it comes to like a lot of descriptive claims so when i was listening to snow bunny recent or not snow bunny damn it i was listening snow to bunny. soul bunny recently where she was going off on merrick for acknowledging that black people commit a disproportionate amount of violent crimes and merrick is obviously far left she, like she believes in systemic racism she's not saying that to stigmatize black people but soul bunny goes off on it to say that you should not even acknowledge that because then you're playing into far-right narratives and hmm. i do think that that is becoming a common sentiment on the far left and my issue there is like if we don't even like if we're so afraid of acknowledging a narrative like that we start to deny systemic racism we start to deny that it even exists in like a major way like this is a major part of systemic racism and how it affects black culture and how it affects job opportunities and how it affects the socioeconomic um um 
reality yeah, of the, reality, the black community yeah. and to to get upset with people for acknowledging this whatsoever is insane like it's insane or the other day i mentioned that when uh or i it was a couple months ago where lav was mentioning that like because men are actually bigger and stronger it makes sense that women would be scared of them and would like advocate for people to uh, for women to stay away from men and to keep their distance and to like train women to um to like run away if they see a man and i said well uh black men genetically do have more testosterone and are like uh, more likely to be bigger and stronger and in the NFL and run faster and jump higher and all of these things, the same issues that women would have compared to men, men might have, com white men might have compared to black men, yet we wouldn't say that it's okay to tell white men to run and hide or to learn, you know, to teach them to be afraid of black men or to teach them to like, uh, to like you know be afraid of them like that none of these things are okay so i don't know why this would be okay with men in these cases yes i start getting accused of like uh parroting far-right talking points and it does seem like it's only the far right who would be a willing to say something like that so yeah Wait, maybe a little have, bit black men have more testosterone than white men yeah like a high, higher testosterone rates on average yeah well, yeah, on average, like, is it like a like a substantial number that would like make a difference? So, uh, you ever never, heard the heard meme? You ever heard the uh, meme? Black people don't have to work out. Um, I guess, yeah, I think I've I've heard something like that before. Yeah, maybe not in those words, but yeah. Yeah, so I I I played football and I had a like my black friends were like always just kind of ripped and never worked out and I was working out constantly trying to catch up with them and they were just kind of like jacked all the way through and they would just never even work out. So yeah, they tended to just like have more muscle than me and I always had to try to play catch up with them. Um so yeah, they're like in some sort of substantial way and this is why like they're going to be more likely to be in uh in the nba because like that's those are like the most important traits when it comes to the playing in the nba no 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 i i get yeah but has this been like bore out by science like has, has this been tested like has this been studied or is yeah. this just a, a belief yeah i got yeah. it I, I, so i i be completely honest I've never looked into it. I've never heard that before. I've heard tons of, of different, um, I guess, uh, hypothesis on why, you know, black people, uh, black men excel at um, sports or well, know, so sometimes appear on average, they could be stronger or faster or run, you know, jump higher or whatever. Do I you know what never, the, um, there was science on that, do but, you know what the bell curve is? Uh, e yes. So a bell curve is generally where like it, you can have like the lowest point and the highest point within the same. Wait, are you talking about the book? Not or... just the book. I mean, like what a bell curve is, like a. Okay. Yes. yes. Conceptually, I know, I, I know both things. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, like the um, Africa has the widest range of DNA, so it will not only have the shortest people in the world, but also the tallest people in the world. Not only has the slowest people in the world, but also has the fastest people in the world. And so it has the broadest range of people all coming from Africa in the same place. So when we're talking about, I think I said uh, average before, it's not average, it's more likely if we're looking at the people with the most testosterone, that it's going to be Mexicans and African American, or Africans. And so that's the, uh, <coughs> excuse me and so that's like what the bell curve is is there there's also africans that might have the lowest number of uh or the lowest amount of testosterone as well so you're saying you re you've read studies that say this yeah i think it, okay. i've uh so this right here serum testosterone says blacks in the United States have the highest prostate cancer rate in the world and nearly twice that of whites in the United States, two to one. Uh, Black-white ratio of the prostate cancer rates is also apparent in age 45, age with earlier prostate cancer occurs. This finding suggests that the factors responsible for the difference rate occurs or first occurs early in life. Testosterone has been hypothesized to play a role in the etiology uh, 
yeah, the etiology of prostate cancer because testosterone and its metabolite, uh, the high the hydrotestosterone are the principal trophic hormones that regulate growth and function. Uh, so like it, this is saying that like even with issues that the black community faces at higher rates, they're facing those at higher rates because of testosterone at higher rates. Um, I can send you like a couple of. Yeah, please do. Your chat is covering up that next sentence. It says, it says mean testosterone. Uh, oh, I'm looking at your stream. You clicked off it. I guess I'm a little bit behind. Um, that next sentence said, did it, was it saying that, um, the, was it saying that, uh, it said like real testosterone or free testosterone rates are 21% higher or something. I, your chat was covering up that sentence. So I couldn't read the whole thing. Um, what did I, do you, did I read that right? So it says, uh, mean testosterone levels in blacks were 19% higher than in whites and free testosterone levels were 21% higher. Both these differences were statistically significant. Adjustment by analysis of covariance or time of sampling, age, weight, alcohol use, cigarette smoking, and use of prescription drugs somewhat reduced the differences. After these adjustments were made, blacks had just 15% higher testosterone level at a 13% higher free testosterone level uh, a 15 percent difference in circulating testosterone levels could readily explain a two-fold difference in prostate cancer risk and then we learn something new every day um yeah please send that to me i want to read about that <laughs> um i've heard people <clears throat> hypothesize all types of things on why um you know black people are more susceptible to certain disease black men are certain susceptible to um more susceptible to certain diseases. Um, and then like black people in general or African-Americans, I should say, um, are more susceptible to like sickle cell. Um, yeah, and people, you know, scientists have been saying uh, for a long time that um, it's it's down to like DNA or, or I don't know, in this case it would be, um, you know, your hormones. Um, but yeah, so that, that that's very interesting. Um, okay, so that's one of your, wait, but is that even a, far right belief or are you just saying that the, the yeah i'm saying not acknowledge these things so it is a far right belief and far right people are more likely to parrot that or to say that belief so like i said like me just saying it is uh people get upset that i'm parroting something that far right people say it is a talking point for the far right but it's also true and so lots of times people will get upset even if it's true that you would repeat it because it leans into what the far right says i happen to debate the far right pretty consistently if i start denying obviously true things <laughs> when when i debate them i'm already losing right off the rip and this is a con consistent thing with the left is where they'll deny like blatantly true things because they don't want to feed into the far right or they're or just because the far right says it they automatically don't believe it so i'm a little bit sympathetic to that um well not so let me just say this um i don't like that line of thought but i'm a little sympathetic to people who um don't want to like feed into right wing narratives. So I, I also run a YouTube channel, but it's not like about politics at all. It's a little, it's about um, like the violence in Philly and the gang violence and stuff. And the way I have to talk about it on my channel, um, because obviously I'm talking about, you know, black on black crime and what's actually going on, like in these uh, gang beefs and shit. So I have to be like very careful with my language because I don't want to attract the wrong crowd. You know what I mean? Like I don't want, a bunch oh, I of I, I don't want a bunch of racists in my comment section I, I, yeah sure. and I hate deleting comments but I gotta delete the one the, the obvious ones like oh, round of applause they're doing a great job like we don't even have to do it like you know they're taking each other out they're exterminating each other like I have to delete those comments and that's not the crowd I want to attract so like I have to be very careful with my language and like the things I say um yeah. for for that reason so I am sympathetic to the idea of like not not acknowledging reality, but being very careful on, on how you um, convey it to your audience, because I'm yes. a YouTuber as well. So I'm very uh, aware of like audience perception and how it's very easy to influence your audience. And you're yes. starting to you're starting to get a, a, a sizable audience yourself. So you're going to start influence a lot of people soon. So I, I before I delve deeper into the Tom Foolery show, I just want to kind of check where you're coming from um yeah i used to be and, far right this was one of the things that 
made me far right was like it just seemed consistently like the other side denied blatant truths and this side was acknowledging them so they must be the honest ones um once i started to like wake up to other realities that they weren't acknowledging um i started to look into like how people get radicalized and this is one of the the things is that like people will find some small truth that a group is acknowledging and then once they once they find that they start to believe all of these other things because they think well these are the honest people so we were talking about andrew tate the other day and the fact that there are small truths that he's willing to acknowledge that nobody else is and this pulls a lot of people in and then radicalizes them into a ton of other beliefs so here i would not recommend that people do this i don't i 100 do not think that people should allow far right people into their audiences but i was far right i've studied a lot of ways that people are radicalized and de-radicalized i've had tons of conversations with my mod team about how we handle these sorts of things um and so we i feel like we are specifically prepared for that sort of thing and allow people into our community from all sorts of radical movements because we're like we kind of know what we're doing, but I do, yeah, I 100% I do not like recommend this. I don't think that everybody should do this. I don't, it would like, it, you can really ruin your community quickly and, and even radicalize a lot of people in your community quickly if you have no idea what you're doing. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing to do. I know, like I seem kind of hot in chat, but you know, you're the loudest when you disagree with somebody. I agree with you with the, like, I seventy percent of the shit I've heard you say so far, just small disagreement on, in my opinion, your framing of of the way the left was handling those riots uh, a couple of years ago. I wouldn't even consider myself a leftist, like really, um, mm -hmm. more a progressive or more towards like the left left center, but like definitely not like a socialist or a communist. Um, even though the left is like a, a wide range of you know political beliefs, but um, so. Yeah, so that that's so just so you know where I'm coming from, that's where I'm coming from. Um, mm -hmm. Also, just one more thing before I go. Uh, I, I think if I, I if I had to categorize but, myself, I would call myself a progressive. Yeah. Well, that, I mean that's that's yeah, you're a progressive that that thinks critically and that is not just going to go mindlessly along with the narrative that you know AOC or Hassan Piker puts out there. You kind of like think for yourself, and I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and another reason I kind of connected with you is, like I said, this is a little off topic, but um, I myself was in a methadone clinic for six years, been clean for the last 10 years, but uh, early, late 2000s, early 2010s, I was getting off of drugs myself. I, I heard you, you know, talk about your story the other night. I wanted to hop on you with, and talk to you about it the other night. It was like three or four and it was really late. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a little bit of common ground there and I would like to, you know, even privately or if you want to do it on stream, we can, but I just wanted to kind of connect with you on that a little bit. Um, just like your experiences as a streamer and I heard you talking about like ha having to kind of like hide it, not hide it from the world, but in, in able to, like, in order to participate in society and looked and viewed at, viewed as a no like a normal person, quote unquote, you kind of got, you kind of have to like hide that part of your history. like. For instance, like if you go to the emergency room <clears throat> for anything, you don't want to ever tell them that you were, that you have a drug history because they're going to, mm -hmm. no matter how long it's been, no matter how, you know, clean you are, no matter how healthy you are, they're always, from my experience, going to look at you a certain way. And that's with a lot of things in life, you know, a, a potential employer, you know, potential romantic <laughs> partners that you might have in the future. Um, so, like, I, I just really, like, kind of. Uh, sympathize with you uh, there when you were talking about that the other day. So I know that's like way, way, way off topic from what we were just talking about, but I just wanted to kind of throw it out there just to, so you can learn a little bit more about me. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's dope, dude. I appreciate it. Yeah, the there seems to be pretty common in this community as well as a lot of people who are recovered drug addicts, not just heroin addicts, but all sorts of drugs. There's tons of people in my community who seem to relate when I talk about that stuff. I like talking about like my personal life and I'm very open about my personal life and the things that I'm going through, the things that I've been through, telling stories about crazy stuff that I did and breaking the law and being in prison and all sorts of crap like that. Um, so I'm like, I'm glad that other people enjoy listening and feel like they connect with that stuff. Cause yeah, that's, uh, those are huge parts of my life and the way that I think of myself. So that's dope. Yeah. 
no, I relate. Yeah, I relate to the journey completely. Prison, breaking the law, all that ex-convict, ex-felon, all, all that good stuff. I relate to all that. And then now being on the other side of life, like where you're, you know, being responsible and, you know, participating mm-hmm. in society and paying taxes and all that good shit uh, that you, you know, I don't know how long you you uh, were on drugs, but I was uh, probably from the age of like 18 to like 28, like 10 years straight of yeah. Uh, just, yeah, just like dropping out of society. But uh, do you I'm ever, 36. Yeah, go ahead. do you still otherize yourself within your own head? Like that you're like, cause I know I do this to myself. Like I always think like I'm, I'm just, I'm not like everybody else. Like, I think everybody else had probably like some sort of clean, normal living and way of growing up and in my head around other people. I always feel like I'm trying to like be like them and that I, and I'm always trying to like fit in with them and uh, trick them into thinking that I'm one of them or something like that. Do you ever get stuck in that sort of headspace? Just so I can understand your question, do I ever get stuck in the headspace of, or do I ever otherize myself in in the sense of like, I'm not like everybody else, like in the back of my head, knowing like, you know, um, that I have these impulses that I, my brain's wired a little bit differently. Is that, is that what you're asking? Not even just that, but that you're like, the things that you're willing to do are different from things that other people are willing to do. That if you told people about the stuff that you've been through and about the things that you did, they would look at you weird like you're like you're different from them. Yes, exactly. Because yeah. they would not understand yes. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because um I'm not a thief. I'm not a uh um I am not a dishonest person. That's not part of my character. However, when I was addicted to drugs I would lie to your face. I would steal out of your pocket if I fucking had the chance. Like I was, I was a, I was a bad, bad person. Like, mm-hmm. like I was like a killer. Like I wouldn't like fucking hurt you or nothing. But in terms of like thievery and lying and all that stuff in my addiction, mm-hmm. I, I'm capable of those things. I see. Like you know, if my addiction takes over my life, like I am, I am capable of those things. And like even, even talking to you with this audience right now and saying those things out of my mouth it feels kind of weird because yes i have kind of like like um i've held those things inside i don't talk about those things a lot because first of all it's so far in, back in history um but second of all it's a little bit like uh it, it kind of like puts you in a it, yeah you're right it otherizes yourself like it puts you in a different place than everybody else when really what we all strive for is acceptance and wanting to be normal, wanting to fit in and wanting to like be viewed as like just a normal person. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't know how far you like went into recovery. I did the whole, uh, you know, like counseling and started the 12 steps. I didn't finish them, but I I, I definitely took in all the information and did a lot of, like I said, therapy and counseling. So I got like to the root of why I even started to use drugs in the first place. And that is the re I think those are the reasons we still, feel the way we feel about like like you were saying like otherizing yourself we have this uh we have this complex about ourselves um uh, self-esteem is self-esteem issues and all, all types of things that play into drug addiction so like um yeah but like i said that stuff is like way far in the past now like i haven't talked about that stuff in so long because i'm not even in those communities anymore like mm-hmm. i don't talk to anybody in my past life i don't like engage with any of that stuff anymore so, so I just haven't had these conversations in a while. So if I seem like I'm rambling, that that's probably why I'm just probably just getting out a lot of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I, I this yet. is, the, I have talked about the fact that like I have other friends who I still keep in contact with all the ones that are still alive. I still talk to them and, um, and the ones who have gotten clean say the same things. They're like, I, you are the only person that I talk to about this. Nobody else would understand. They would look at me different. If they found out the things that I did, they would think that I'm like a bad person or they would think of me as like this this wild animal or something. And so like, they're like, I can't ever talk about this stuff with people because I it, they would find out that I'm not normal. They would find out that I'm not like them. And I do this, like, especially working in the corporate world, I always to myself am thinking, I'm I'm doing my best to pretend I'm like you guys. I'm not like you guys, but I'm doing my best to trick you into thinking I'm like you guys. Like, yes, there's yeah. there's always this thing of like trying to fit in and trying to be accepted and uh and otherizing yourself. Whereas when I started being open about that stuff and talking to people about it, yes, their jaws drop, they're very surprised. But 
the surprise makes me feel better actually like when they're yeah. when their jaws like, drop no, and they're not like you what? yes like, exactly you used to be on drugs that's crazy yes yeah, so I, I get where you're coming from with that yep or you, yeah it's you a, went to prison little... no way no you like you're the clean uh, yeah, cut yeah. professional guy no no way like yes <laughs> it's yeah yeah, you never know. Like, so that's why I think like people who have had a history of whether it be prison or, or, or you know drug addiction, we look at like we look we look at things a little bit differently. Like we try to um, not judge a book by its cover, so to speak. So I think that's how maybe you got a little bit sympath. Maybe you already were far right, but like that's how you're able to sympathize with, um, like you said there. Uh, um, how'd you put it? Um, you said you sympathize with far right. Uh, talking points so or like, yeah uh, descriptions yeah, yes descriptions descriptions um not prescriptions descriptions uh because you can look at things for what they are without having to because like when when i was on drugs i was reduced down to the lowest rung of society and like in that mm -hmm. in that um space i saw white people i saw black people there was puerto ricans chinese Asian. there was so many people that that ended up at that methadone clinic it kind of gave me a chance to step back and say you know, like people from all walks of life can end up in the same place if you just make a one or two mistakes. Um, <laughs> life is very precarious, it's very precious. We had to really tread carefully and step carefully and kind of not really, I try not to judge people for where they're at and just try to lead them in the right, what I think is the right way of where to go. Like I, I try to meet you where you're at. And then mm -hmm. that's how, that's why like I can put up with people like Destiny and, um, like Vosh and Hassan, because while I feel like, well, especially Vosh and Hassan, like they have some very far out there takes. Destiny's more like, like Milk Toast, like regular dude type of, like he has some crazy takes too, but he's more, I guess, uh, rational, I guess you could say. I'm, I'm more accepting or, or like uh, understanding or sympathetic to, to their ideas or their beliefs because like, like I could, sympathetic isn't the right word. Like I can get, I can see where they're coming from, put it like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't like to like um, take them out of context. Destiny too, and or even people on the far right. I don't like Ben. Chip well, he's not far right. But, like people on the far, far right, like Nick Flint says, like I don't even like to take him out of context because yeah. he might say some shit that I agree with, and then like, like what I just can't agree with him because I don't like him because like like none of the Jewish shit, none of the like racial shit. I don't agree with him, obviously, um, and not even like the sex stuff, but like more like the. Um, what Nick Flint says, it's more like the, it's only like one thing I've ever heard him say that I agree with. I'm just using him as an example as like, as like how I can look at people and like, I'm able to accept them for what they are. I'm sorry if that's, I'm really rambling right now, but that, that's just the gist of what I was trying to say. I want to, yeah. I want to talk to you because I, I kind of like, I'm trying to fill out where you're coming from. I kind of like your show. I like listening to you. I like hearing Appreciate like. It different points of view yeah yeah no yeah i like hearing different points of view from where i'm coming from so disagreement in my eyes is like unless we're like screaming and cursing at each other it's always like a, a, a helpful thing and a thing that helps you grow so i just want to hop on there and hop on here and say that say hello to you nice to finally meet you i've talked to you in chat a few times but yeah cool man I'm appreciate so it much more of your time appreciate you jumping on yeah, man. yeah um next time i disagree with you i'll hit you up and we can hash it out awesome all right, later, man. All right, Tom. Thanks. <clears throat> um, link in chat, STV Philly. Go follow him on YouTube. Um, he's got, I think, a, I believe a couple of debates with Vosh. I'm not sure. Um, there was... There was something else. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention, like, for me also, it wasn't until very recently, very recently, until I got into the Twitch politics space, I realized growing up in an all-black community, like, very much separated me from all of these freaking white people. Like, I, I never realized... Because I never really talked about, like, black issues and, like, you know, crap like that with 
with friends, with, you know, at school, with coworkers, like you don't ever really talk about that sort of stuff. So then getting onto like panels and listening to a bunch of these white progressive people talk about crap so quickly i realized just how out of touch they are dude how how much they just literally have no idea what they're talking about i grew up in an all-black community went to an all-black school when my dad pastored an all-black church um like i i very much identify with that community even when i moved to georgia all my friends were still black like that was just that's that's just who i identified with that's who i enjoyed being around and um like that was something else that yes like it just it made me feel like very set apart from all of these other people like they like um like whatever the white experience is i don't think i know what the hell that is <laughs> like like whatever that whatever the hell that is I, when they talk about it, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what this freaking crap is, dude. I don't get it. Like, I, I, these people are just so far out. And I, when I say that, I don't mean like, I don't experience like white privilege or white fragility or anything. Like, obviously I get all that. I experience all of that, but I mean like white culture and not understanding other cultures i grew up in new york right like i grew up around all these other races i was always around other people that were not like me or didn't look like me it was always this like melting pot of different people and the and then getting into twitch politics and listening to these people be like yes in white suburbia where we're all white and we've never seen a black person before and we don't understand what a black person even means we don't have any clue what it is that they're going through and i'm like i okay maybe that's you guys i like i i, I don't know where that is but okay like i guess i guess that's get i heard that over and over and over and over from all of these white people I was like okay I guess that's a real thing. I just, for the longest time, I thought these like white uh, libs were just like freaking making crap up to virtue signal. But apparently I've heard it so many times now that I'm like, oh yeah, yeah this, I guess that's a real thing. Like they, they all just have a very different experience from me. Uh, what part of New York are you from? I'm from Staten Island. I lived on, uh, lived on Staten Island, went to school in New Jersey, and my dad's church was in the Bronx.